Thank you very much, Dahi, for your uh, introduction, if you're welcome. Uh, and I'm delighted uh, to uh, have the opportunity uh, of uh, being here today to address the Institute uh, for International and European Affairs and uh, to see such uh, a very uh, large and distinguished uh, attention, uh, attendance uh, for uh, this uh, pre-presidency uh, uh, council. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge indeed here the uh, presence of uh, uh, so many of your excellencies, uh, ambassadors of uh, both uh, European Union uh, countries and, uh, and other countries uh, to, to, to Ireland. I've been asked uh, to focus um, this afternoon on foreign policy issues and specifically uh, on what we see as the main issues facing the European Union over the period of our presidency next year. However, before coming to this, uh, I want to, to say a few words about the important discussions uh, that are taking place uh, in Brussels uh, as we speak, um, and that may indeed uh, continue uh, for a little while yet. Uh, I was in uh, Brussels uh, yesterday, uh, Brussels a lot this week actually, I was there for two days at the beginning of this week, but I was there yesterday with the Taoiseach uh, at the summit and uh, up until uh, late last night. Uh, I want to tell you that progress is being made uh, in hammering out a new multi-annual financial framework to fund the Union uh, over the seven-year period uh, 2014 uh, to 2020. Following a very long day yesterday, uh, during which uh, President Van Rompuy, accompanied by President Barroso, uh, met bilaterally uh, with each and every one of the 27 heads of state and government, uh, President Van Rompuy uh, prepared a revised proposal which sought to take account of the most serious concerns of delegations. It is on the basis of this document uh, that the leaders are continuing uh, their discussions, uh, resumed today at midday, uh, and uh, are, uh, were, were, were continuing anyway when I last checked uh, about 15 minutes ago. Uh, I have to be frank, however, and say that um, these are extremely tough negotiations. There are a range of uh, very strongly held positions in the room and it remains unclear whether it will be possible uh, to reach agreement at this summit meeting. Uh, I very much hope that a means to bridge the gap, uh, the, uh, the very substantial gaps uh, that remain uh, will be found. Uh, I'm absolutely certain that a positive outcome is in the best interests of the European Union and especially of Ireland, both as incoming presidency but also as a member state working extraordinarily hard to emerge at the end of next year from our own EU IMF funding programme. An agreement on the MFF would illustrate to our citizens and to financial markets that the EU is prepared to strike a deal on something as important as its budget, even at a time of severe economic strain. We need to show that the art of compromise and accommodation through which the EU has achieved so much, remains alive and well. Reaching an agreement now would boost the stability of our shared currency, would provide us with an ideal platform to take on over the period ahead the challenges of strengthening our economic and monetary union, which provides the very underpinning of our common currency. Not reaching agreement on the MFF at this meeting would, of course, be very disappointing. It would then fall to President Van Rompuy to decide how best to take work forward in the months to come. Should it prove necessary, the incoming Irish Presidency stands ready to support and assist him in this vital work in whatever way we can. This conference, Dahi and colleagues, is timely, coming as it does just six weeks ahead of the start of our EU Presidency. This will be our seventh presidency, but the first in the post-Lisbon era. As you know, the Lisbon Treaty has considerable implications for the role of the rotating president, that the role, uh, for the role of the rotating presidency in relation to foreign policy. Essentially, the presidency now pro pro plays a supporting role to the EU High Representative for Foreign and Security Policy and the European External Action Service. Cathy Ashton and the EAS are in the lead 
in taking forward the work to be done under the common foreign uh, and security policy and common security and defence policy. It is for the High Representative to provide a voice for the Union in the positions we take on, uh, we take on the great uh, international challenges of the day. Within that, however, there is scope for the Presidency of the day to offer particular encouragement on individual issues and to complement the work of the High Representative and the EEAS in advancing areas of particular concern. And this is something that I have discussed directly with uh, Cathy Ashton uh, and have uh, an understanding with her about our uh, respective roles during the course uh, of the Presidency. For our part, we would hope to make a contribution in relation to conflict prevention and resolution, helping to identify how the Union's capacities for mediation in conflict situations might be strengthened and the work of the EAS supported. At this point, I want to turn to some of the major foreign policy challenges which are facing the European Union at present, and I will then look at a number of areas where uh, a more direct role will fall to Ireland during the Presidency. The Middle East is, of course, a region of abiding challenge and difficulty for the European Union. When the Foreign Affairs Council met on Monday of this week, the major issue on our agenda was the escalating violence and conflict in Gaza and southern Israel. We have all been horrified by the casualties and suffering on either side of this conflict. More than 100 people in Gaza, many of them women and children, have died since the crisis erupted. Six Israelis have also been killed as a result of rocket fire from Gaza during the same period. I obviously warmly welcome the ceasefire agreement which was reached in Cairo on Wednesday evening. This will hopefully bring to an end this latest cycle of violence. I want to commend the Egyptian government and all other regional and international actors who contributed to this successful mediation effort. It is of critical importance that both sides now abide by the terms of the ceasefire and ensure that there is no return to violence and destruction which we have witnessed over the past 10 days. Both the people of Gaza and the people of Israel are entitled to live in peace and security. The conclusion of the ceasefire agreement should not blind us to the fact that the underlying problems of Gaza and in particular the unjust and counterproductive blockade which Israel has been maintaining, have not gone away. I hope that the ceasefire agreement now reached will contribute in a significant way towards first easing the blockade and then ending it completely. And this is an issue to which Ireland will continue to devote priority at EU level. Ultimately, the problems affecting Gaza can only be resolved in the context of a comprehensive and lasting settlement of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict achieved through negotiations and based on a two-state solution. In this context, we devoted considerable attention at Monday's Foreign Affairs Council meeting to the resolution seeking observer state status which the Palestinians intend to table at the UN General Assembly later this month. I have already indicated, including in my address to the UN General Assembly last September, that Ireland will be willing to support a resolution which is reasonable and balanced and which recognises clearly the need to restart political negotiations aimed at a final and comprehensive peace agreement. I reiterated this position at the Council discussions this week. There are differing viewpoints. It must be said, some of us plan to vote in favour of the resolution, while others favour a common position of abstention. This is a particularly difficult issue which raises, in my view, fundamental problems of credibility for the EU, given the long-standing support which we have expressed for Palestinian statehood and the relatively modest step which is now sought by the Palestinians. With regard to Syria, this is an issue that has been the subject of constant and intensive attention at the Foreign Affairs Council over the past year. The conflict there is steadily worsening. Hundreds of people continue to be killed every week and a major humanitarian emergency is looming with the onset of winter. In the words of Lakhdar Brahimi, the UN and Arab League's Joint Special Representative for this conflict, Syria now faces the star a stark choice. Either there is a political settlement of some sort or it risks becoming a failed state. 
While the chances of early political progress remain slim, the Special Representative is pursuing all options, including that of building on elements of the agreement reached in Geneva last June. There has, however, been one positive development. Agreement was reached in Doha earlier this month on the creation of a new umbrella opposition grouping called the National Coalition for Syrian Revolutionary and Opposition Forces. The establishment of a unified democratic opposition comprising both internal and external opponents of the regime has long been sought by the international community. It is to be hoped that this new group will succeed in bringing together all strands of opposition opinion. A number of our EU partners have already moved to recognise it as the sole legitimate representatives of the Syrian people. However, Ireland and many other EU member states believe that more time is needed before according formal recognition to a body which has only just come into existence and about which relatively little is known as yet. On Iran, the Iranian nuclear programme continues to be a major cause for concern at EU and international level. Last month, the EU adopted a further package of sanctions, mostly centred on the financial sector and aimed at persuading Iran to engage seriously in the process of negotiations with the E3 plus 3. Now that the US election is out of the way, High Representative Ashton will endeavour on behalf of the E3 plus 3 to organise a new round of negotiations with Iran. There is, in my view, no alternative to to diplomatic means for resolving this issue. I would expect that African issues will continue to feature on the agenda of the Foreign Affairs Council in the period ahead, most most particularly the crisis in the Sahel region and the deteriorating situation in the Democratic Republic of Congo. With regard to the crisis in the Sahel region, and in particular in Mali, the EU is pressing the Malian parties to agree a political roadmap which would facilitate a return to constitutional governance. When that roadmap is in place, the Union will resume bilateral development cooperation funding to support Mali's economy. Plans are being made for a military force with ECOWAS and African Union involvement, which would help the Malian authorities to re-establish law and order throughout the country. The High Representative and the External Action Service are also planning for a possible EU CSDP mission to train the Malian army. The EU will also continue to play a central role in responding to the humanitarian needs of civilians and displaced people in Mali and neighbouring countries. Some 5 million people in Mali are at risk as a result of the food crisis, drought and insecurity. Ireland is playing its part and has provided over 9 million euro in emergency assistance to the Sahel region to date this year. More recently, attention has focused on the deteriorating situation in the DRC, with an upsurge in violence linked to the activities of the so-called M23 group. In the Foreign Affairs Council on Monday, we called for an end to all violence, including rape and sexual violence, human rights abuses and the use of child soldiers by all armed groups. The EU is supporting the efforts of the DRC government to reform the armed forces and to achieve peace and stability throughout the entire country. I have placed particular emphasis on the need for all sides to fulfil their obligations under international humanitarian law in terms of protecting the civilian population and allowing unhindered access for humanitarian agencies and aid workers. Ireland's EU presidency comes at a crucial period in terms of shaping the post-2015 global development framework. From a development perspective, Ireland will seek to build on the strong thematic focus which our Irish aid programme on hunger and nutrition and to develop the linkages to priority challenges such as climate change. A special event on the United Nations Millennium Development Goals, which is due to be held during the 68th session of the UN General Assembly in September 2013, will consider the progress to date on the Millennium Development Goals and consider for the first time the shape of the post-2015 Global Development Framework. A key priority for our Presidency will be to ensure that the EU adopts a strong, coherent and, above all, a credible position for the UN Special Event. The post-2015 Development Framework 
will be the main focus of a meeting of EU development ministers which will be held in Dublin on the 11th and 12th of February next. We are also planning to host an international conference in Dublin in April 2013, bringing together the themes of hunger, nutrition and climate justice and focusing on the lives of smallholder farmers in the developing world so as to ensure that their voices are heard in the post-2015 framework debate. During our presidency, I will be chairing the General Affairs Council. As you know, the, this council has primary responsibility for formulating EU positions on enlargement, and this is an area to which we will be paying close attention. Ireland has al always been a strong advocate for enlargement of the Union. We see it as a vital tool for encouraging a more democratic, prosperous and stable Europe. We welcome the Commission's recent progress reports and enlargement strategy. During our presidency, we look forward to working to facilitate and to advance the enlargement process for all candidates and prospective candidates. We will oversee consideration of the final monitoring report on Croatia and expect to see Croatia ready to join on the 1st of July 2013. For those countries currently in negotiations, we would hope to open almost all the remaining chapters with Iceland, with the possible exception of Chapter 13 on fisheries. There's always, there's always one, isn't there? Uh, we will also seek to open uh, one or two chapters with Montenegro and push for progress uh, on the rule of law chapters 23 and 24. Progress on Turkey's accession will depend on the willingness of all parties, both EU member states and Turkey, to facilitate this. We are hoping to open at least one chapter if that proves to be possible. As regards the other two candidates, we would be supportive of the opening of accession negotiations with Serbia during our presidency on foot of a positive report from the Commission on Relations with Kosovo. We are open to any creative suggestions that would allow Macedonia to move forward, including the Commission's suggestion that negotiations be started using the agreed temporary name with a view to resolving the name issue at an early stage. We are happy uh, to try and seek agreement on this during our presidency. There are three further Western Balkans countries with a European perspective. Ireland is supportive of agreeing to grant candidate status to Albania on foot of a positive report from the Commission. We will do our best to progress a stabilisation and association agreement with Kosovo, which the Commission recommended is legally feasible. We are supportive of Bosnia and Herzegovina's EU perspective. However, Bosnia and Herzegovina must make real and sustained progress in order to realise this. Accession is a long, slow process, but it is one that requires continual forward momentum. Stalling or stopping now would likely result in regression and a possible return to the instability that we saw in the early 1990s. And that is in no one's interest. Enlargement has contributed to our security and as a result to our prosperity. And it is for this reason that it is a priority for me personally and for our presidency. The EU's engagement on human rights issues is another area of particular interest and importance for Ireland. We very much support the mandate given to, to the new EU Special Representative for Human Rights, uh, Stavros Lambrinidis, and we will provide support and encouragement for the early and effective implementation of the EU Action Plan on Human Rights and Democracy, which was agreed last June. As you know, Ireland has just been elected to the UN Human Rights Council for a three-year term. This will begin on January the 1st, 2013, the same day that we assume the EU presidency. Ireland has long championed the promotion and protection of fundamental human rights. It's an issue which is a strong resonance with the Irish people and which is at the heart of Ireland's foreign policy. I'm very much looking forward to our term on the Council, which will give us a very real opportunity to amplify our contribution to human rights globally. Promoting greater coherence in EU external policies, including at the UN and in other multilateral fora, will be an important objective of our forthcoming presidency. This will apply in particular at the Human Rights Council, 
where we will work with the EU delegation and member states to advance strong EU positions on human rights. Issues which may arise at the Council during our presidency, including the ongoing, ongoing crisis in Syria, protection of human rights defenders and support for civil society. The promotion of arms control through a strong international rule of law is another key foreign policy priority for Ireland and a further area in which we hope to provide support and encouragement for the EU's work. One of the major issues facing the international community during our presidency will be the negotiations on an arms trade treaty, which will take place in New York in March. I remain hopeful that this conference will succeed in producing a strong and robust treaty to regulate the international trade in conventional arms. Before concluding, I would like to briefly refer to our chairmanship of the Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe. We are approaching the end of what has been a productive and successful chairmanship with a number of high-level engagements throughout the year and several high-level conferences in Dublin and Vienna. We are currently engaged in final preparations for the 2012 OSCE Ministerial Council, which will take place from the 6th and 7th of December at the RDS. This will be the largest ever gathering of foreign ministers in Ireland, with approximately 80 delegations and over 1,200 delegates. Our goal is to secure a small and balanced packages of decisions and declarations for adoption at the Ministerial, taking account of the difficulties which arose in previous years when too many draft decisions were in circulation. We have also tabled a Helsinki Plus 40 decision to provide a roadmap for the organisation's work in the lead-up to the 40th anniversary of the Helsinki Final Act in 2015. Our OSCE chairmanship has been yet another occasion on which Ireland has demonstrated a strong commitment to the multilateral system. This is a commitment we will carry through to our EU presidency, which begins on the day after our OSCE chairmanship concludes. In conclusion, it is worth noting, with some pride and satisfaction, the great honour which was bestowed on the European Union recently with the awarding to it of the Nobel Peace Prize. This, I think we can all agree, is an eloquent recognition of the contribution made by the Union in promoting reconciliation, democracy and human rights worldwide and in enlarging the space for peace and stability across our continent. Ireland, as incoming presidency, will work to uphold the values which underpin the EU's engagement with the wider world and which have earned it this fitting tribute. And we look forward to our six-month presidency with confidence uh, and uh, with uh, commitment uh, and uh, we uh, are determined uh, that our six-month presidency of the European Union will leave it in a better place than we find. Thank you.